thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Beth Mace. I'm the chief economist at NIC, and I also direct the uh, research and analytics group. So if you have questions on data and things like that, myself and my group are, are uh, the people to chat to about. So I'm delighted to have you all here. We're going to be talking today about the investment thesis for seniors housing. It's a topic I've been talking about for about 25 years, but COVID may, may or may not have changed that. So to talk about that, I have three esteemed panelists, many, all of which I've known for a really long time. Um, starting on my far right is uh, Brian Sunday. Brian is a managing director at AEW, and in full disclosure, Brian and I worked with each other for a really long time, because I used to work at AEW, so for 15 years-ish kind of thing. Way too long. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <Yeah. laughs> Next to Brian is Steve Schmidt. And Steve is the National Director and Production Manager for Seniors Housing at Freddie Mac. Welcome. Great. Thank you. And directly to my right is John Moore, who's the CEO of Atria Senior Living. And John and I have known each other for a long time. Long, long time. <laughs> long time. So um, we're going to be talking about the investment case. So we'll be talking about the short and long-term impacts of the pandemic, um, what demographic factors are uh, impacting it, um, underwriting assumptions, return assumptions, the impact of obsolescence, and other factors. So just to get us started, I have just a few minutes to show you some slides I had prepared to give us some context. Um, also, did you know that on your phones you have a, an opportunity to send us questions on the app? And if we can't answer those questions, we will do so, if we can't answer them during the session, we'll try to address them afterwards. So thank you again for your attention. So let's talk about the opportunities for the sector. So first, and you're going to hear a lot about this, and this is a thesis that you've been hearing throughout the entire conference, is it's a need-driven industry with strong demographic growth. And I'm going to show some slides with that. Second is, there's a lot of product diversification and segmentation going on in the market. When I first started talking about seniors housing, it was pretty typical mansion style, sunrise style opportunity that we were looking at. Now you see a much greater diversification in terms of the, the client or the resident who we're looking at from someone who's high income to someone who's more middle income. And a, a phrase that Nick developed a few years ago was the forgotten middle. So we're seeing a lot more operators be actually working and discussing the forgotten middle. We also see high acuity to end of life properties. And increasingly, we were seeing a lot of interest in what is being called active adult. So that's lower acuity um, uh, clients or residents on that. Sorry, got to figure this out for a second. Hmm. I don't think this is working. OK, product diversification. OK, um, and aging. Okay. And aging and obsolete inventory. So if you look at the NICMAP data for the 31 largest markets, about 61% of the properties, so three of every five properties are more than 17 years of age. And what we also learned during the pandemic was that seniors housing is much more integrated into the healthcare continuum, and that's probably here to stay. And finally, the value proposition, and maybe that's changed, and we'll talk to the panelists about that. But you know, in the past, you always knew that you had support and safety, and I think now we're looking at more socialization and security and, and purpose that the, uh, a resident base really wants to have. So we'll talk about that. So demographics are destiny. We always hear about that. But it's important to remember, consumers have choice. So even if you build it, will they come is the question, right? If you, if you sell it, will they, will they subscribe to it? So the growth in the 80 population, is, this is the demographic piece. So in 2017, there were 185,000 additional people that turned 80. In 2021, 325,000. 2025, 500,000. And in 2027, we'll get a million new people that are turning 80. So you've heard a few times in some of the sessions, if you've attended it, that the demographics are here. Well, this is demonstrating that the demographics are here. In the year 2030, we'll have 800,000 people move into that cohort. You also um, are going to have, because of the demographics, the, there's a, something called the caregiver support ratio. That's the number of uh, older adult children, the caregivers, and those are the people who are 45 to 64. <laughs> Fewer of those to take care of those people who are over 80 years old. And on the right, you can see the chart that demonstrates that, that in 2015, that ratio was 7 to 1. 
And in 20, uh, 29, it's going to be 4 to 1. And uh, as it continues out to 2036, it's going to drop to 3 to 1. So that's a factor. You don't have a, you don't have what, a child, essentially an adult child, to take care of you. We also know that divorce rates are higher. In the middle income study that we did, we found that today about 62% of people um, were married, but by 2029, they're going to be about 52%. So the divorce rates are going to be much higher. So this is an important and compelling piece for the investment case. If you don't have children to take care of you and you don't have a spouse to take care of you, you really do need congregate setting of some kind. So if you can't see this in the back, I try to always put a little humor in these slides. So the guy on the right's standing in front of his wife and he says, I can still fit into the old uniform. <laughs> so it's a changing face of the customer and he's trying to go back to how he looked you know, many, many years ago. So is today's consumer, are they gonna accept the word seniors? Maybe not. Um, they, nobody likes to be called that. So we're starting already here is changing the language to older adults. Um, people want, they don't want to go away and, and, and uh, sort of, um, they don't want to go away and just be forgotten. People want experience, they want lifestyle, they want to be engaged. They want purpose, and purpose is really important. And I've heard uh, Lisa Meyer uh, Ryerson from um, AARP has actually called the activities director the uh, uh, purpose coordinator, purpose matchmaker. So what we're trying to do is we're switching from the customer who was originally the greatest generation, who's then shifted to the lonely few generation or the silent generation into the baby boomers. And we're all trying to figure out what it is that they want. They want safety and support, but they also want socialization and engagement. Oh, look, he danced, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so what are some of the challenges? So those are some of the positives in terms of where the opportunities are. So some of the challenges, uh, you've heard a lot about labor and you've heard a lot about wage rates and we'll come back to that. Another challenge is what, what is the actual trajectory for, for COVID? And um, I have a slide to show that in a moment. Consumer preferences, again, if you build it, will they come? What is the consumer of tomorrow and even what does the consumer of today really want? We've heard about squeeze margins that you're seeing this expense rise, expense creep associated with ex uh, labor and also insurance. At the same time, the occupancy rates are low and that's causing a challenge to raise revenues or raise rents. And so as a result of that, you have a squeeze margin situation. There's a lot of changes um, going on in terms of uh, care coordination. And we've seen that really demonstrated through COVID. And of course, sort of the elephant in the room all the time is affordability. And how do you actually create a product that the more general population can adhere to? With regard to labor, there's one idea I wanted to share with you that I don't think has been spoken about, and it's the national numbers on labor force participation rates. And they're showing that the labor force participation rate for women is, is the lowest it's been since the 1970s. And why is that? Because a lot of those women have young children and child care centers have been closed, or the ratios of how many children a caregiver can provide has really shrunk. So there's don't, they don't really have an opportunity. So you're forcing these women to be in a position, do they take care of their children or do they go out and earn a paycheck? With regard to the um, recovery timeline, this 76.9%, that was the occupancy rate for assisted living as of the third quarter according to the NICMAP vision data. So how quickly does that occupancy rate increase? From peak to trough, so pre-COVID, the first quarter of 2020, to the um, lowest point, which was the second quarter of 2021, we had lost, uh, for assisted living, 9.6 percentage points in occupancy, 9.6. In the third quarter, we saw an improvement of about one and a half percentage points to the 76.9, but we're way below where we were pre-COVID. So what is that trajectory? There was a session just before mine that my colleague Lana spoke at, talking about the three buckets that you have to fill up in terms of getting that occupancy rate back up. You have to figure out all the units that came back into the market have to be filled. All the units that were been under construction and added to an inventory during that time have to be filled. And then all the new construction that's currently underway has to be filled. So that's, those tranches are, are significant. And when you do the analysis, it can range from either two years to seven years, depending on the pace of absorption and the pace of demand that you're interested in. So going forward, what are some of the considerations, especially for the investment case? <clears throat> the industry is maturing. I've talked about that. We're seeing product diversification and segmentation. You're seeing a shift 
from just low acuity lifestyle settings such as active adult to high acuity um, ADL settings and healthcare settings. You see high price points to low price points. So we're maturing like the hotel industry where you have a Motel 6 up to a Ritz and that's what we'll, you'll see some discussion on that. <clears throat> new supply, sometimes we talk about that because we're afraid of new supply. Well, in fact, it's really good. New supply is great, especially post-COVID. It's going to bring us new designs and new features, new offerings to address what the new consumer is going to want. Changing consumer preferences. Again, if you build it, will they come? They have choice. How do you define home? Is home where they live in assisted living? Is home where they live in their traditional residential um, home? Or how, where is home? And again, the demographics are coming, but consumers have choice. And lastly, it's really important, given everything we've been hearing about labor, to really pay attention to when you do marketing, you have to market not just for new residents, but you have to market really for um, new workers as well. So with that, that's sort of the background for you. And now I'm gonna take some of these questions over to the panelists. Again, if you have questions, you can type them in into your phones and we will address them. So, Brian, starting with you. <clears throat> so, AEW, I think you just finished fundraising your fourth fund. Correct. In seniors housing. I was involved in your first two, so I don't know how you're possibly <laughs> surviving on your, these two, but. Um, so, I think you had a capital raise of $500 million. So, when you were raising that money, what kinds of questions were you getting from um, potential new investors into these funds? Well, a lot of the raise was pre-COVID, and so uh, as you can imagine, uh, there was a lot of interest in senior housing, obviously building up to pre-COVID. Um, as we kind of morphed and COVID started and we were still fundraising, uh, a lot of the questions, you know, at the time, because it was early on, is, you know, what's going to be the long-term effects here? What, what is COVID going to do to the, you know, I guess the demand pool, uh, you know, for the senior population? Are people not going to move in? Is there fear, right? And so early on, we didn't have answers to those questions. I don't think anybody did. Um, but as we kind of, you know, started coming out of this, you know, and I would say back, and if you look in the summer of 2020, when we kind of opened back up, you know, there was, uh, you know, the demand side was there. And I think that put a lot of fears, you know, from our institutional investors uh, at ease, saying, listen, people are still moving in. People are not overly scared of this product or coming in and, and, and getting COVID, right? If anything, it was, you know, a safe environment. And I think that's, that, that was big for our investors, right? Then there was noise, there was disruption, but knowing the fact that the, 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 the resident demand was not shrinking or did not run the other way uh, was crucial for them to continue to have faith and, and wanted to invest in this space. So at Investment Committee, what kinds of questions are you getting now in terms of investing in the space compared to sort of pre-COVID? Uh, the biggest question we're getting is when are we going to be back to pre-COVID NOIs and occupancies? Um, I think, you know, people, at least our committee, because we've been investing in the space so long, they get, the, you know, they, they get what happened. They, they, they understand the challenges there. But people really want to know is when are we going to be back? Um, and that's, again, that's a hard question to answer. Um, just for my, my, my own <laughs> sake, I say 2023 just to buy me another year of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of job security. But, you know, I think, you know, you've heard throughout this entire conference, right? There's obviously some challenges, but we're all heading in the right direction. And I think, and, and the hope is here, that 2022 is going to be a lot better than 2021, and then 2023 is going to be a lot better than 2022. And I think that's what we're working towards. And I think that is, you know, the most important part, at least for our committee, to really see, right, all the stuff that Beth talked about, all the stuff that we're going to talk about up here today, that there is a path, you know, the path in some cases is a little tougher than others, but there is a path. And, you know, this, this industry has proven to be profitable pre-COVID. It provided really good returns and yields for our investors, and it will get back there someday. And I think that has not got lost, uh, you okay. know, through our committees. Great. Steve, at Freddie Mac, you're obviously a preeminent lender in the industry. I think you provided more than 30, 14 billion dollars of debt capital to the senior housing industry between 2016 and 2020. So about uh, almost three billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. That's quite a lot. Um, so, and I believe actually the delinquency rate on those loans is close to zero. That is true. So it's a pretty good bet. So. Why is seniors housing a good lending opportunity? Why is, why is the delinquency rate low and why do you want to continue lending into the industry? 
Uh, there's is a, a number of reasons. First, I would say something that's obvious to me and probably a lot of the people in this room, but maybe not everybody, is that when you compare senior housing to all the other commercial real estate classes, senior housing and multifamily have government. We have Fannie Mae, we have Freddie Mac, we have HUD providing underlying support for those uh, product types during what we just experienced during the global financial crisis. Um, so there's a great underpinning of long-term capital for seniors housing. So that's, that's kind of a first. The second would be, so I, I come from a background I used, I've been doing senior housing for over 15 years, but part of that I did all, all major food groups of commercial real estate lending. And I had a mentor early in my career who, who he, he would basically say, Steve, if the demographics are against you, there's, it's impossible to make a good real estate investment. So seniors, you know, the numbers you showed are hugely compelling. I think we've, the national population growth rate is under 1% now. I think it's trending at like yep. 60 or 70 basis points, which is shocking. But um, we're talking three, four or 5% annual growth rates are coming to seniors housing in the next couple of years ahead. So that's, that's a huge tide that, that should lift all boats long term. Um, I would also say we've been doing it for, we started in 1998, so we've been doing it for 23 years. Our current really great default rate has been the same throughout all the cycles. Mm. So um, I think that's, you know, having that kind of performance puts a lot of uh, support behind continuing to be in the business as a long-term player. So I'm sure everybody in our audience wants to know your view on lending today versus mm -hmm. during COVID. Are you loosened up? Are you more? We've definitely loosened up. I mean, in the, in the early days of COVID, we to use, I've overused this, but the Wayne Gretzky analogy, we had to underwrite to where the puck was going, not where the puck was. So we were underwriting, expecting, you know, occupancy declines, and that's what we were underwriting to, to hit our debt coverage requirements. We also instituted typically 12 month debt service reserves to have, sort of be a safeguard if, if a property actually went below 1-0 coverage and the operator needed some cash to keep it going. Fortunately, not, um, I think we had one of those actually used. Um, we also had um, we also had forbearance programs that were used, but all those have been paid back. So um, we're now in a position, I think once, once the vaccines vaccination rate hit 90% at the resident level, I think it took a lot of the stress out of where is this gonna go. Yeah. Now, I, I think you alluded to it, we'll talk about later. Probably the only thing we're more concerned about now is labor, labor rates, but we see a continuing occupancy increase. So yeah. it's, it's sort of as long as NOIs, and we think even with labor rates rising, NOIs are still gonna be rising. We feel pretty good, so we don't have, we're certainly not underwriting lower occupancy, we're not underwriting debt service reserves. We're back to run underwriting to our policy minimums and debt service coverage. So we're pretty close to being back. That's great. To where Good we to were pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure a lot of us of are happy outlook. to hear that. All right. John, as chairman and CEO of Atria, you've led the company on a very strong growth path. Today, I think you operate 400 properties um, and more than 47,000 units across 45 states and seven Canadian provinces. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> um, and that's up from, I think, about 200 communities as recently as 2020. So why such rapid growth? What do you see in the industry that's making you wanna forge on that path of rapid growth? Well, well it's not really rapid growth. I mean, it's, it's the, the effect of the holiday transaction, um, which is, you know, for us, it's about, you know, when we look at how we wanna uh, set the business up to, to face the 2020s, uh, we're kind of focusing on yeah, both ends of the spectrum from a price point point of view. Yeah, you may have read yeah, recently about the building that we just started pre-leasing in San Francisco, yeah, joint venture with yeah, related, yeah, the related companies. You know, the idea with that program is to absolutely slice off the top. And so the first deposits yeah, for yeah, that building, yeah, most of them are in the 20, thousand dollar a month range um, at the a same month. A, a month, month. <laughs> yes at, at the at, you know at the same time you know we, we we love the holiday approachable price point model very efficient 
um, you, 18, 19 FTEs, and it's not some of the, the skill sets you need for licensed um, assisted living. And so it's, you know, we're kind of um, going to both ends of the spectrum. One, um, where you can uh, make money by driving top line, and the other end where you have the tools to, you know, to be, to be efficient. So what would be the rent in a, like a holiday type? Uh, you know, by comparison, twenty five hundred to thirty five hundred a month. Wow, so that's a pretty wide range. Yeah, it and it's the you know the opportunity there, uh, you know, great uh, you know partnerships with Well Tower and Ventas, um, you know Sabra and and NHI. But it's the great Bill Colson building. The buildings are um, most. Tell our audience they might not know that. Yeah, Bill Colson founded Holiday many many years ago. And he built a, the Holiday Buildings. There's a left Twix and a right Twix. Yeah, that's they're they're identical. Um, in senior housing, the chance to sort of take a product and build an efficient operating model at scale um, is 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 pretty exciting. Um, it, you know, they're they're mostly they're sort of home size apartments, um, one and two bedrooms, two thirds one and two bedrooms, and 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 we think that's a product. Um, you know that that will be that's great. Those are great places to be in the market, where you can efficiently deliver um, an approachable price, or you know if you can set yourself up to really have a top line driven business in underserved markets, big cities. Um, you know the highest and best use for real estate in New York City and San Francisco was condos. Why why build senior housing when you can sell condos for two or three thousand dollars a foot? So. The supply penetration is so much lower, yeah, you know, in the big cities. It's hard to develop, and with a with a partner, yeah, you know, like related, that's an exciting opportunity. So, and then you combine that with the bulk of the Atria portfolio, which is coastal, in and around New York City, New York City to Boston, um, and California. That that's kind of the idea. So most of that growth, in in fact, if it wasn't for Holiday, we would actually oh, be shrinking. Uh, oh, all right. So talk a little bit about the technology. You're you're really I know, um, do a lot of technology in your buildings. Just a little bit to, to create efficiencies among yeah. your staff, among other reasons. Yeah, I mean, there, there are two types of technology. There's, there's um, operating applications, you know, front of the house oper operating applications. So, um, you know, we have a, a wholly owned subsidiary called Glennis. Anybody wants to call Glennis, Glennis sells full suite of front of the house, you know, from CRM to revenue management to care management, um, you, you know, to uh, EMAR. Um, to quality management. EMAR is? And electronic medical uh, records. Re re reminders. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there's that. So you digitize everybody's job to make it more efficient. Our caregivers um, you know, download their, their rounds or their task on, a, on an I, uh -huh. iPod um, and can check off what, what they've yeah. done or what, what they need to do. So create sort of real-time efficiencies there. Yeah, you know, but but much more. So you read about um, the echo spot that's going in the Coterie building, where you know uh, Amazon has has uh, allowed Alexa to be to to be fleet managed. So I can we can use you can use an echo like an intercom, and you can use an echo to access your your information and your database and 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 create efficiencies for staff. So much they, they're. The, the, the technology that will really create staff efficiencies, yeah, you know, wearables that track staff and residents, there, there's, there's just a bunch going on. So exciting. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, Brian, so let's talk a bit about returns. What are returns today and how do they compare with pre-COVID returns? What are, you, what are you telling your investment committee? <laughs> yeah, I think right now, if you look at returns, if we're going to buy a deal or build it or develop a deal, uh, I think with still some uncertainty out there in the short term with labor, with where stabilized, stabilized occupancy is going to settle out in certain markets, right? I think buyers are going to want a little bit of a you know higher yield than we did pre-COVID. I mean, you're taking risk, right? So anytime you're taking additional risk, you want to get paid for that. 
Um, and I think that's a reason why transactions also are not happening as, uh, as much as we would like to see right now, because buyers are going to want a little bit more return, and sellers are still unwilling to give that up because in the seller mindset, which we are uh, as well, buyers and sellers, is that you know, it's just a matter of time till we get back to stabilized occupancy. So no, I'll just wait. You know, I'm not going to give you the discount right now. Um, and so, you know, our target to our funds, you know, pre-COVID, we're, you know, 10 to 12 net to our investors. Um, that's where we're still aiming for. Uh, it's just, you know, um, I think for taking the short-term risk, we want to get paid. And so, you know, we're probably targeting, you know, if we can on an existing deal, you know, leverage returns in that kind of 10 to 12, 13 range. And, you know, development's tough right now, the pencil. We're cost star, you know, not knowing exactly where stabilized NOIs are going to shake out. Uh, you know, development and we're financings, uh, construction financing is more difficult to get. Uh, it's getting really difficult to pencil returns. And again, you're going to want a little bit higher return than you did pre-COVID. Um, and you're just not seeing that out there. Hence why, you know, developments uh, in the supply, you know, supply is still muted. To How would that compare to multifamily? You know, multifamily is it's very intriguing right now, and I think this is a great data point, and I've just been focusing a lot on it. I mean, if you look at multifamily cap rates, you know, over the last 12 months, I mean, they've compressed, you know, 50 to 100 basis points in certain markets. I mean, you just take California, and multifamily cap rates are in the, the low to mid threes, oh. right? Senior housing cap rates haven't changed, right? So for stabilized, we'll just call it, you know, five and a half, you know, high five. You know, that spread is over 200 basis points. Um, Pre-COVID, you know, that spread had shrunk to, uh, to less than 100 basis points, right? So it's, you're seeing where multifamily, I'll even say industrial, you see where industrial is going right now, right? Investors are having a hard time getting yield, and it's why investors are really, you know, focusing on senior housing right now, because, because the yields look pretty good. The only thing that we're missing is a stabilized NOI to cap. And so it's just a matter of time. And I really do believe that once we do and once, you know, buyers get a little bit more conviction in the cash flows, feel very more comfortable in the underwriting, that you are going to see cap rates compress in the space. It's just, it's, it's too wide right now. I, I, I think there are a lot of sort of chicken and egg things yep. that will give, it, if a, a courageous, it's a great opportunity for a courageous investor. Correct. Because the, the, the reality is the, the demographic moves that Beth is, is talking about are huge Correct. You know, relative to the supply of, of, of senior housing. And the fact that you can't make a senior housing construction deal pencil while you're going to have this increasing demand from, from, dynamics, from, 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 the, from the demographics, you know, guess what? Eventually rates are going to go to the feasibility rate, Correct. the rate that delivers a, a 9% return on development. And that's a lot higher than where rates are now. Correct. And so that's, that's the, it's, it's coming. We've got, to, we've got to work through what we're working through. Um, but but there, there should be a big upward bias in rates right. over the next several years. And I, and I think we're at a tipping point right now. You know, I think you talk to a lot of buyers and Every, you know, everybody was ready, at least we were ready to come out hard in the third quarter here and really be aggressive on deals. And obviously we all know Delta kind of set that back a little bit. More talk on the labor set that back a little bit. But I really do think we're at a tipping point right now where buyers can see, like to John's point, that rental growth, right? We can actually, you know, see it and feel comfortable underwriting it. And so six months ago, we were scared to do anything more than 3% rent growth because we just didn't know. I think now, and a lot of you know, a lot of buyers out there see, you know what, five, seven, ten percent rental growth. That's 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 attainable, and we're going to start seeing it as we're, we're actually pushing through our 2020 budgets, and we're actually going to see that real growth. And people and buyers are now going to be more aggressive to take advantage, and try to get in a little bit early, like John said before. You know, you really see that really uh, that that push. And that so, Steve, would you would you take if you were looking at something and someone had underwritten five to ten percent rent growth, would you nod on that, or would you react to that? Well, we've always been, we've always underwritten income in place. That's, maybe that's, we've always been a cash flow lender. So we underwrite income in place. But it, I would it, tell you that with it's those where kind the puck of, is going to go unless it's going into gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's, 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 uh, no, but I think it's, going. I think it's, you know, it's, we have, we have how we underwrite, but it's also what deals are you going to lean into? Um, you know, if, if we're seeing, if we believe in that kind of rent growth, then things like expenses, while they're, concerning, 
become less of a concern yeah, because, because there's a countervailing <laughs> force that's going to take care of it for us. So it's, 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 there's a lot of art to it rather than the science. Yep. And John? No, I was, I was uh, um, you know, just going to sort of reiterate that, that I think this is a very interesting moment in time. Yep. Um, it, it's, it's, we had, coming into the pandemic, we had overbuilding. Supply was getting ahead of demand. That's about to flip. Yep. Just drive demand from demographic growth. That's about to flip. And it's interesting, every additional pause we have sets up a brighter future, correct? And 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 so you know it's pretty it's 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 a you know I, I think it's it's a pretty interesting time. We we have a lot of stuff to contend with. You know it's it's yeah, we have to get across the fire swamp, but yeah. So you know, the, pa there's, the pause there's, there's that you're happiness on the other I think side. The pause you're referring to is that there was a slowdown in starts during COVID because a lot of lenders weren't weren't. Um, providing capital for a new development. So if you look at the starts data from NICMAP Vision, you'll see that they're a pretty sharp slowdown. So that should translate into slower inventory growth about a year, a year from then. So we're looking at uh, the end of this year into 2022. So and that should last for a while. Now, that said, I've talked to a lot of operators and, and developers and capital providers, and there's a lot of people that are really interested in developing again. So there's probably a short, short window, but to your well, point. Well, but, but it's, you're at that, you know, as Brian but says, it sort of it's, it's the, you know, the cost to develop, it, it's making it hard to it's pencil. A lot, it's so a lot of noise. It, it's not a slight, even though you can get a piece of land and have an idea, it's, 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 it's hard to execute. Okay. Yeah. Are getting a guaranteed max price contract, right? Today yeah, from a, from a contractor. Issues. Yeah, doable. And I mean, so. just look pre-COVID, right? You, we were buying stabilized deals north of 150 percent of replacement cost, right? If we went out and bought a stabilized deal, we're actually probably at or below replacement cost, right? So right. that's pretty, com you know, that's yeah, that's a pretty compelling stat right there. And so yeah. that's going to again get more people comfortable in underwriting, in acquisitions, to be more aggressive. Yeah, and that was, I was more of an observer. Maybe, maybe you were there too at the time, but it feels more like the last time I think occupancies were this like crushed was probably post 2000 when there was a lot of overbuilding. And my memory is people made a ton of money who yeah, invested. Yeah, I don't think we've ever had them as low as this, at least by yeah, our record. Yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely. So anyway, it's, it's happened before. Mm-hmm. John, any comment on that? I, I mean, it, it's, I was, I was going to say it's, you know, intra-year in 2009, I mean, you had a, you had a big V in 2009, you know, the, the bottom um, close to 80% and the end of the year, you know, close to 85, 86 for, you know, for us in the, in, in the, in the financial crisis. Um, you, you didn't have all the dynamics that you have going on now. Um, you know, but that that led to such a great run from 11, 12 through 15, 16. Um, John, what kind of questions do you get when you, you've, you have some really good, loyal capital providers? Are you getting any really difficult questions right now from them? Well, yes. How come we can't <laughs> grow in Hawaii this month, right. you know, this quarter? Yeah. You know, it's it's a, you know, it's it's. I mean, our investors are valued based on cash flow, so current cash flow um, is everything. So, you have to both do everything you can to deliver current cash flow, while you're also setting yourself up you know, for for a, you know for a smarter for a smarter future. So, you, you know, and and you know, smart investors. I mean, you've seen the, it's both Well Tower and Ventas invested more. In the, in the holiday product, approachable, yeah, e easier from, from the dials you have to turn and manage, easier to, to run in a, a uh, difficult labor environment. Yeah. And, and also a, a segment, so one, one thing about the demographics as well, there's another interesting uh, you know, part of the demographics, if you take annuitized wealth of people, people over 75 or 85, I think, are the two cuts you can get. And, and you, you, you split it into um, low, middle, and high in, in terms of the, the, typical, the typical breaks. In terms of the number of seniors 
that are in each of those groups, it's not just going down on a percentage basis. The low is going down on an absolute basis. You know, the middle is doubling, you know, and the top is tripling or something like that. Yeah, I forgot middle studies showed that too. And part of that was explained by the fact that um, people are more educated and education tends to translate into higher incomes. So that that was exp um, translating into those ratios. You, you know, but in, in, in one of the things that your chart you know, leaves off, there's this outlier year in 23 where there's gonna be 600,000. The yep. 80 plus population is gonna grow by 600,000. To put that in perspective, I think if you look at Nick data over a long period of time, yeah, 90% occupancy has been achieved when you've had, you know, round numbers overall, nine to 11% supply penetration in the 80 plus group. Mm -hmm. So if you take 10% of 600,000, that's incremental demand for 60,000 rooms. The industry produced 40 to 45,000 rooms yep. in 2019. Yeah, so, I mean, these are, these are really, really, um, powerful shifts that are there. And, you know, people talk about pent up demand and whether or, whether or not what's happened this year, there's been a lot of occupancy recovery, you know, from February, March on, and whether that was pent up demand or does it have to do with the fact that the 80 plus population is growing by 325,000 this year when it grew by 175,000 150 to 175,000 every year, 2005 to 2018. Yep. Is it pent up demand or are we actually starting to see? We're here. Know, <laughs> yeah, we're here. And, and it's gonna, you know, and, and it's gonna grow by 400,000 next year and so on. And, and, and it's, it's, it's uh, th there is a scenario that, you know, the, the occupancy recovery of this year that, you know, a lot of people are selling it. Um, 115, 120% closing that percentage of the, of the deals they were closing in 2018 and 2019. There's a scenario that says that's driven by increasing demand, right. not by pent up demand, and no reason that doesn't continue in 22. Yep, the demographics sure support that, I agree. And, I, and I've done some analysis too that agrees with, uh, in terms of the supply and the unit count that's gonna be required, um, it's, it's growing significantly. If you just use the same penetration rate with a growing number of individuals. And there's an argument with the, the caregiver, you know, the caregiver ratio, penetration has to go up. Yeah, Because I you totally have to use congregate settings, you know, to serve seniors because they, you know, they can't build that, mm -hmm. you know, care system on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and one other point is don't forget about the obsolete product, which is going to get taken right. offline. It just there's some product out there that you just can't make work. So or, or there's great opportunity to redevelop. make to make yep. yes to redevelop. Yep. Yep. But that's a net zero gain, right? So it's not. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we have to sort of talk about labor a little bit because I know it's been talked a lot about at the conference. But Steve, let's start with you in terms of you know when you think about the se sector's recovery. Um, labor certainly could be a constraining factor. We're seeing um, some operators report that they can't actually take residents in because they don't have the right staffing requirements. This tends to be more for skilled nursing than, than for seniors housing, but um, any ideas you have, Steve, that you guys have been talking about within your shop? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a concern, but we're basically, the, you know, um, we're gonna be looking at the borrowers and their budgets and what do they need to do and, and probably underwriting to that. And I would tell you that we're, you know, 3% increases seem too low. I think we're hearing, you know, five, 7% it feels more like what's needed to actually attract mm -hmm. the talent um, and get people in. So, um, but it's the same thing. I, you know, that's gonna be, we've got rising occupancy and hopefully rate, and it'll take care of itself. But the, the net net is still an, an increasing in a Y. So yeah. we'll lean into those deals. And Brian, you have the observation of seeing a lot of operators because you work with a lot of operators. So probably a whole host of different um, discussions going on about labor. Anything that stands out that you no, want to share? No, I, I think I'll just add is I think when you look, I'm going to try to take an optimistic view here. Okay. So, which is unlikely. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, so I think anytime you see a struggle or you see, you know, in labor, which we're having right now, you kind of see, okay, what's going to be the effect, right? What's going to fix the problem? And you're kind of already seeing it, right? 
you're having operators being creative, right? Creating better benefit packages, creating more amenity space inside the buildings for, for employees, thinking of ways, you know, whether it's uh, transportation credits, is it childcare credits, right? People are coming up with different ways, right, to attract employees. Wages are up. So yes, the short term is going to be painful, but at the end of the day, right, I think we're going to, operators are going to have a better environment to attract better employees, right? And I think, you know, was it needed pre-COVID? I, I don't know. I mean, that's an argument we can go back and forth on. But I think ultimately, and it might be 12, 24 months, you know, the result of labor challenges and the, and our, and the way our uh, operators are counter-attacking that, you're going to have, you know, an environment where I think it's a better overall places, uh, place for employees to work. And, you know, I think that's a good thing long term. But it's painful now. It's just something, you know, the industry is going to have to continue to work through and be creative on. So, John, you did an amazing job during COVID in your company in terms of keeping your staff engaged. The conversations that we've had um, during since March of 2020. Can you tell the audience a little bit about, like, what you've been doing with your team uh, members to keep them engaged and keep them... Motivated? You, you know, it's, it's, I mean, during COVID, a big part of, of what we very much tried to do was be there with all the PPE and support that, you know, that they needed quickly. Um, you know, a testing screen. Um, we did over, there was over 500,000 PCR tests done in the Atria portfolio oh. um, through the pandemic. 350,000 of them got shipped to Rochester, Minnesota, for Mayo Clinic Labs, we were able to get um, we were able to get um, results in our trackers within with less than less than two and a half days. It, do, doing things like in and around New York City, not just giving uh, staff masks to mask and gloves before everybody knew it was really an airborne thing, not necessarily a um, tactile thing, but um, masks and gloves to commute in a new mask every day to commute in. On Friday, a you know pack of, of uh, half a dozen masks to take home for family. Just it, supporting them, you know, in in, in 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 what was a difficult fight. A lot of attention, you know, being turned to, you know, what's the value proposition for for you know for staff. So, you know, whether it's you know, it benefits that it's tuition reimbursement, things we've always done, but it, but are there more you know, more things that we can do? Um, you know, career development, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Treating, you know, recruiting like sales. Um, we were delayed four hours in the airport yesterday in Louisville, and uh, we handed out two business cards. One, one there was a, a, an Army nurse, a major who uh, was, she's getting ready to retire. She's looking for a place for her mom in Denver. She's also looking for something to do. And so, um, you know, had a conversation with her, gave her a card, um, and we'll look for her on the recruiting Rec website. Recruiting at the airport. Yeah. I haven't thought of that yet, have you? Yeah, yeah the, the, the best one was, the, the, other, the other one was the hostess at Chili's. So four of us go to Chili's, and we say, can we sit down? And they say, well, well we, she says, well, there's a section in the back that there's nothing going on. She says, well, let me ask whether a server will take care of you back there. And the server's like, no, we, you can't seat people back there. So we sit down at the gate across from Jilly's. Five minutes later, she comes over and she says, I'll take care of you. So we sat back there. She served us, got the tip. Um, and, uh, you know, lo and behold, the other servers said, you know what, we can do that too. The next thing you know, revenue had doubled in Jilly's. <laughs> So we gave her a business card and said, we want you to come work for us. <laughs> All right. Those are clever ways. I hadn't heard those But, yet. but that's, it's, it's going to take that. I mean, we're in a, we're, we're pushing the stone up the hill, and we may be close to the top, and we can't see it because we're on the other side of the stone. But it's, it's one foot in front of the other. It's, it's doing everything you need to, to to attack, you know, workforce, adjusting wages. You know, guess what? It's, it's all math. He won't get anybody to invest in new buildings unless net of your expenses, you know, you can deliver, you know, nine percent on the cost to build the thing, and if that means rents have to go where they have to go, they they eventually have to go there, and and so for people that are going to develop, that's good news. But for people who have existing products who are who are fighting out the expense war, 
that's great news because you're going to get, Correct. we all need to get to where we need to to pay for the new world. Okay. So I'm going to take a few questions for the audience. If you have some, type them into your apps. Um, so um, what will be the catalyst for disenfranchised workers to return to the assisted living industry? Anyone want to take that catalyst to bring assisted living workers, disenfranchised workers, back to the AL industry? I, I, I think I've heard, I, I, everybody's talking about it. It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the group that has left the workforce are women, and it's women in their 30s and 40s. Right. So it's the return of, of comfortable childcare. Yep, I um, agree. Is, 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 a very, is a very big thing. Yeah, I would throw out there that immigration is not helping. Right. Not to get political, but we need immigration. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a question about, um, again, a labor question, but related to like education. So do our speakers believe that an important component of investing in the future of the industry is supporting the growth of educational programs surrounding the space? And if so, how? And specifically, this is mentioning the new Boston University program that they're developing a master's degree. <laughs> Call out for Boston University. But what, how does that fit? So there's a, we know that there's an organization, Vision 2025, and there's a number of universities across the country that are proactively working to develop um, folks to, to enter our industry. We also know that it's a much faster track if you're in the senior housing industry to get to become an executive director, per se, than if you wanted to go into the hotel industry to, to run a hotel. So um, any thoughts on that? You give out tuition programs first. For yeah, and, and one, it's not exactly that, but one thing that's happened as you know, the wage requirements have gone up, and, you know, we're recruiting directly at nursing schools, you know, competing mm -hmm. with um, and, and, and offering a different kind of experience right out of nursing school or right out of a, a, a CNA program. Um, and, and that's sort of the same thing, but it's, it's not just paying more, it's increasing the quality of the, of the, of the, of the human capital as well. Okay. Um, let's talk vaccine mandates a little bit. So, John, you were one of the first ones to, to do that. And I think that the quit rate from that was actually pretty low. Is that, is that right? Yeah. And has that helped you in terms of uh, bringing folks in, in terms of occupancy? I, I, you know, I, you know, argue that it was, you know, the, the vaccine mandate was worth a thousand movements to us this year. I mean, we, we started our yeah, big occupancy growth um, really in February. You know, kind of a couple months before everybody else, and that's after having announced a vaccine mandate in in uh, on January 11th. Yeah. You know, it was an interesting thing. It was, it was lonely. It was really surprising to us that hospitals that mandate a flu vaccine weren't mandating the yeah. COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, the, the state of Massachusetts mandated the flu, va flu, vaccine, or flu vaccine in 2020 um, for all workers in licensed AL situations, and that scared us to death. We thought we were going to have to hire a bunch of people in December of 2020 with education, with pushing it, with people understanding that they needed to do it. Um, you know, we had two or three people that we lost at the end of the year, and it was a major, it's like, look, this works. And it was a, it was a, a major driver in, 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 uh, in us deciding to do it. But I will say that it probably, it, it was one of the more sort of culturally unifying things that we've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we basically sold it as, look, um, you know, our residents deserve to live in a vaccinated environment. Staff deserve to work in a vaccinated environment. You deserve to go home and, 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 and put your family at less risk. And, you know, everybody sort of wanting to own that decision, it, even though it was made from the top, everybody wanting to own that decision, I think, was a, was a really good thing, you know, for the business and, and really, Helped has helped us, you know, move forward out of out of the difficult time. Great. Okay. All right. So we've talked. Remember, the title of this is a investment case for seniors housing. So we've talked a lot about demographics. We've talked a lot about some of the challenges related to, to staffing and, and vaccines and COVID. So what have we missed? If it, what if you when you go out to pitch Brian, which you do, um, 
to, to bring in a new pension fund or something. What are the other selling, selling points that you present about wanting to invest in senior housing? Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at this industry and why it started, why it became so popular is this industry was created for a need to take care of the aging population, whether that was care, whether it was socially. But the point of this whole asset class is to take care of the aging population, right? That's not going to change. That ultimate fundamental is not changing. There is a need for this product type. The, the, the operators, the people in this business are in here for a reason. And that is a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong point to, to have when you're looking at this asset class. And you know, to me, right, you know, I just hope, you know, going forward, right, there's gonna be disruptions, there's gonna be changes, right? But this industry has proven over the last 20, 25 years when we had these disruptions that every single time it's come out stronger. And so history, you know, history is kind of proof in the pudding here. And I think this is probably the biggest disruption, at least that I've seen since I've been in this space, uh, to have a global pandemic and, you know, basically shut down, you know, for six months and, and having to fight this. But this industry will come out stronger. There is a need for it. And the people who, who operate these communities, the people that, that, that put their heart and soul in this are creative, they're innovative, and they're gonna find better ways to, to, to be more efficient. Technology is gonna play a big, big role going forward, and this industry will be back on the top you know, here shortly. And I think that's, uh, you know, that to me is you know, the big selling point to investors, and, and, and they buy in, and then rightfully so. so. Yeah, I would actually give a shout out to operators in this room, as well as their capital partners. Um, for the incredible job that everyone did during, <laughs> during COVID. Um, talk about showing agility. It was an industry that never shut down. You had to keep going, um, and it was amazing. So for those who were on the front lines or even on the management lines, uh, the, up, the, up the streams there, uh, thank you and a shout out from certainly everybody at Nick. Um, so Steve, anything that we've missed if you were trying to pitch uh, Senior Housing or any challenge that we Internally. haven't talked about? Uh, no, I don't. I think I think for us, um, so Freddie Max, the reason we have such affordable capital is there is an implicit government guarantee there, um, but there's a charter that comes with that, and that charter requires us to be very mission driven. So to provide liquidity, affordability, accessibility um, to the market and. It's very easy to go to Capitol Hill. We, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't need to lobby anymore, but, but when Congress hears about what we're doing, that's a very, very positive thing. And we are measured on the amount of affordability, affordable um, transactions we're looking at. And fortunately, seniors housing is a special category in that sense. It, it is looked at, you know, this is a frail population that needs to be taken care of. Quite frankly, in a public policy standpoint, I'd say another reason it was created was because skilled nursing is very expensive. And you had a bunch of people in skilled nursing that didn't have to be there. They, they, if you put them in assisted living, even IL to some extent, yep. you could take care of them at a much lower cost. So it's, there's a lot of public policy benefits to it that I think underpin it again, that there will always be that kind of governmental support. We saw it, right? We saw PPE programs. Yeah, absolutely. For fire relief, I think it's been slow, but it's there. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the major key to our success, I think, over the 20th years has been focusing on really good sponsorship in terms of owners and operators. And they've proven, like Brian said, to be extremely adaptable. No matter what comes their way, they find a way to do the job well and ultimately thrive. Okay, John, same question. What have we missed in our conversation here? You, you know, it, it's, I don't think a, a lot missed, but also just to say, it's proud to be associated with an industry that is so adaptable. You throw a pandemic at it, so the pandemic starts to wane a bit. Then you, you throw the most difficult labor, you know, you know crisis that, that we've seen, and, and we're gonna figure it out. And, 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 and fight through it to, you know, to get to the other side. It's even, you know, it's, uh, we solved the, there was, it was uh, a month ago when we were worried, we weren't sure we were gonna be able to get turkeys for Thanksgiving because, <laughs> of, you know, the supply chain is what it is. But it's, it is a, you know, you know it's, you know, and, and, and to hear everybody talking about the issues um, that are, 
daunting, um, you know, here, you know, at the conference, everybody is taking them on head on. Yep. And, and uh, you know, we're going to get to the other side. We're going to get to that 800 to a million a year in <laughs> increase. In that population in, in, in derivative, you know, And derivative demand up 80 to 100,000 units a yeah, year. And, and honestly, you know, if you look at the, um, the highest birth rate was actually in 1957 of right. that baby boom. So baby boom was born from 1946 to 1964. And, the high, and so it's 1957. So the numbers that we showed, that million, yep. that, that's just a tip of the iceberg. So there's more and more coming mm -hmm. our way. 15 years. <laughs> so, all right, and another question for the audience. Um, Brian, <laughs> should investors expect a lower return for a middle market product versus a market rate or a luxury? Uh, unfortunately, at this point, um, I'd have to say yes. Uh, this, this, this labor challenges, the increases in wages, you know, the one sector that's getting hurt is the middle market. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about pushing rate, I mean, you're just making it a little bit more unaffordable for this, for this, uh, for this part of the population. Um, and so I, I, I know pre-COVID, a lot of people in this industry, ourselves, we were doing, you know, do, doing some, you know, more affordable product. There's been a lot of focus on it, and unfortunately, I feel that this labor issue has really set that back a little bit. Um, and so, yes, if if you're going in and looking at middle market, the margins are going to be lower. It's going to be harder to push, you know, push rate and cover expenses. So, it's you're going to have to at least and. and in the short term until more creative product is created or if there's more, you know, whether it's government help or some, some, other, uh, some other way to make it more efficient or, you know, to help subsidize the rents, you, you have to expect it's going to be, uh, you know, a lower return here, unfortunately. John, what do you think? Well, the, yeah, and, and that's, we talk, talk about, like, tech, technology, um, if you have a wearable that can track where you are um, so you can do status checks and meal checks digitally. Correct. Um, you know, it's it's you know in some states you have to ha prove that you checked on a resident four times a day. If you can do that, yeah, um, you know, with a with a wearable or digitally have a it, also a walkie-talkie. I mean, there, there's there's a it it's it's also time to see whether all this consumer electronics can. You know, not just make it easier for people to do their jobs, but 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 but, but find ways to, to to create efficiencies and 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 people and you know people are 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 doing that. And, you know, and it's a that's I mean that's why we're you know we're you know really approachable at the at the holiday rate, simple operating model, or you know let's go where we can get you know as much top line as you possibly can. And, you know, I think. The middle is going to have some great opportunities because it's going to sort itself out. It has to. The numbers, has to, people, right. people need, are going to need a solution. So, um, you know, people will figure it out. It's a harder bet to make, but it's probably a really, really good bet. I agree. How about healthcare coordination with that? So, in the middle market, that's that's a sort of a tougher nut to crack in terms of that's pretty labor intensive too. So. You know what? What we're trying to do is not necessarily healthcare coordination. Maybe that's the right. Maybe coordination is the right word, but it's try to um, enhance work to you know help people have better access to healthcare. Mm. You know whether that's telemedicine technology, so they can have a visit with a doctor without having to to uh, to travel there, or you know potentially you know, you know partnerships with. You know, Medicare Advantage networks, um, you know, where people can have all-in-one, yep, you know, yep. comprehensive health care and tie that to, um, you know, affordable, um, more approachable price point senior housing. There, there are lots of things like that to, you know, to try to think about. And a lot of, and people are, are doing, they're innovating right, right now mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in thinking about those things. All right. So I see we're about to, out of time. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope we've addressed some of your questions about the investment case for seniors housing um, and also highlighted some of the challenges. So it's not going to be a simple, smooth path, as we've talked about. But I think the long-term um, success of the industry is, is pretty apparent. And um, I think that's it. you guys have a, uh, anything else you want to say to close up here? All right. Well, thank you for participating.